triumphal story of medicine. Sadly, as you'll see this week and then with the follow-up next week, not quite such a triumph as we used to think. And perhaps we haven't solved as many problems in medicine and healthcare as we'd like to think we have. So, on with the story then. Called it Microbe Hunters, because that's what's going to happen. And notice what this is going to do. It's going to change a shift in emphasis about our concepts of disease. It's going to change our notions from a diseased body, which is what we were talking about last week, really, physiology, to disease in the body, something that kind of invades the body and then causes disease, which is a different concept, as we'll see. Anyway, see how this works. Here we are. Okay, so just quickly, um, a little overview of what might happen to you if you go to a doctor or health centre in 2016. Well, you might come with a sore throat and a runny nose. That would be your symptoms. You would tell the doctor. Uh, you might have a bit of phlegm in your throat and a cough. More symptoms, as we would call them. You would explain that. That would be your story, remember? We talked about that the other week. You might, if you were really bad, perhaps have some temperature and chills and be a bit sweaty. So that would be your story. You would tell your medical practitioner. And what would they do? They would probably do a fairly quick diagnosis. And they would probably say, well, it's probably a bacteria or a virus. They wouldn't be very likely to say to you, well, I think it's all in your mind. Or um, go away and run around the tree outside chanting a spell. Probably not terribly likely. They'd be much more likely to say it's a bacterial infection or a virus. So what we're going to be asking today is, where did that idea come from? They certainly wouldn't have been saying that 40, 50 years before. No, would they have been talking about the spells, obviously. But this is a relatively new idea, and we're going to look and see where it came from. So just very quickly, let's have a little look back and see what other stories of ill health, looking for an explanation we've heard already in this course of lectures. Well, the first ones, remember, were supernatural intervention. If you were feeling a bit sick, it was to do with the gods, the god, um, neighbors who didn't like you, who put a spell on you. Really good explanation. Sadly, not really an awful lot you could do about it except blame the gods or the neighbors, but sort of satisfactory in its way. And apparently in psychosomatic areas, if that was what was the matter with you, it could work. Here's another one, slightly more sophisticated, that we talked about in the... Um, first or second week, an imbalance of humours. The fluids in the body, remember? The bile, uh, the black bile, the yellow bile, the blood and the phlegm. They got unbalanced. Not that anybody ever saw this. It was all in the mind, as it were. Nevertheless, the notion that these fluids were imbalanced caused you to be sick. And actually, the doctor we just talked about in the last slide could have been saying that. Because if you're coughing up phlegm, a Hippocratic doctor would have said, well, too much phlegm. Plainly, you're getting rid of it. This is very good. Not exactly what we would say, but they could have said that. A third one was one we haven't really talked about so much. We'll talk about it in, in, in a lecture in a couple of weeks' time. Miasmas. If you remember back, that was Galen's explanation for epidemic disease. How did everybody get sick at once? Miasmas, a state of the air or something in the air, slightly more sophisticated version. That was an explanation. And finally, what we talked about last week, if you remember, lesions in the tissues of the body. In other words, people looking at bits of the body for an explanation of how you were sick, a physiological explanation. So today, getting around to this eventually, we're going to talk about a new story. A specific disease, that's quite a new idea. There's you and there's the disease. Before that, you were the disease, basically. So we're going to look at how this separation took place, of the idea of a specific disease. And we're going to say, is this a new concept? Uh, actually, not as new as you might think. It just hadn't been taken up before. 
ideas, any ideas, ideas that are around today, over in the science faculty or the medical faculty now, ideas are rarely new, quite frankly. But the latest research will be an idea that's taken off at the right time. All the other factors will be there to make it popular with people for whatever reason. And this is a story that exactly shows that. An idea that's been hanging around a while, things came together to make it a popular and usable idea in health and medicine. So, let's have a look then. There's a slightly complicated idea, which I'll explain to you because it's a phrase you may hear. Contingent contagionism. What on earth did that mean? Well, contagion was just the old word for infection. Before the 19th century, they tended not to use infection as a word. They used contagion. So contagionism is just um, infection as it takes place, as it were. Contingent means it depended on something. So the old belief before the 19th century about disease was that actually it wasn't always an imbalance of the body or a miasma. It was quite clear to some people by observation that there were some things that seemed to be our disease, whatever that meant. Here's, uh, as I've said, some illnesses couldn't be explained by the previous stories. And what were they? Well, here's a couple. Sadly, very, very prevalent and still leprosy still is in some places. Smallpox has been eradicated, as we'll see in a later lecture. But leprosy and smallpox appeared to be, although nobody knew how, passed on to each other. It didn't seem to fall under the explanations of all the other stories. It appeared to be passed on. So that's what contingent contagionism means. Some health problems, let's call them that, were seen to be in some way passed on from person to person. A whole family would get the same thing at once. Um, a whole village would get the whole, and they'd get the same symptoms. Now, we know, of course, if somebody, you catch a, you don't catch so many today, do you? But if you get something like chickenpox from somebody, your symptoms aren't always identical. But they're usually fairly similar, the same kind of rash, a bit of a temperature. You know somebody's had that. You probably think, well, that's what I've got. Even in the past, people did think that. They just didn't know how it happened. But only a few illnesses could be explained away like that. And as I've said, it was hard to explain them because nobody knew how they were transmitted. And you couldn't find, if you were doing like an epidemiological survey, in other words, what is it that causes disease to be passed on? You couldn't find factors that were the same in one case as another. It was tricky. Um, can't remember. <laughs> I'm trying to remember now why I put this picture in. There must have been a really, really good reason for it. Um, I can't remember what it was. Sorry, it's probably, it was probably meaningful when I put it in. Anyway, we're only talking about a handful of diseases. However, however, things are about to change. And this is what makes people much more interested in this particular story. It's a very, very sad and dramatic story about what was referred to as the great pox. Pox is just an old word for... In for disease, illness. The great pox of the 16th century. And it's often held up as a case study in early contagion. It really pushed people in the direction of thinking that diseases were perhaps infectious or contagious. Why? Well, because it was pretty dramatic, that's why. You'll see what this picture is in a minute. Um, any of you who know a bit about history in this period will know that 16th century in Europe, not just Europe, actually all over the world, was a big time for voyages of discovery. Ships had become a little bit more seaworthy than they were. They were bigger, they were built of better materials, they could go further. Not compared to later ships, of course, but comparatively they weren't too bad. So you could put a crew on board. Sailing on the seas was the best way to go and investigate other countries. It was the safest way. You were less likely to be um, set on by thieves and robbers. Of course, you could be set, set on by pirates. That was always a worry. But sea travel was much safer than land travel. 
So people, countries, powerful countries, tended to invade countries that they could get to easily by sea. An obvious one from Europe to get to, if you look at a map even now, um, was the American continent. So like Canada, North America, South America. Relatively easy to sail to. So that's exactly what the voyagers did, to what they called the New World. Sadly, uh, navigation wasn't maybe as good as we might like to have thought, and they didn't always actually get to where they meant to go to. So Columbus and various people like that, you've probably heard their names, don't worry, I'm never going to ask you what their names were, actually ended up in South America, and in fact some of the islands off it, rather than North America, which is where they were heading to. What happened there? Well, hence the picture. Obviously, connections, even if just meeting, between native populations and the explorers, whatever you like to call them, explorers, invaders, conquerors, whatever they were, they were there in quite large numbers. So these European, they were men, they were nearly always men, um, came across the native populations. We know now that in some countries, some parts of the world which are relatively cut off, and of course you'll realize there aren't many these days, but there are a few, they tend to have their own health problems, which are specific to their population. And if you're used to a particular health problem, it tends not to affect you so much. So talking about infectious diseases, as we would call them now, a particular population is often relatively immune to the infectious diseases that are in their area. I mean, it's obvious, isn't it? you'll have had a generation who's probably had that disease because they tend not to have immunization. So if you've had it, you get immunity, you get a natural immunity. However, natural immunity does not happen with people who appear on your shores from a completely different background and area. So, you might say, <laughs> was the revenge of the natives who lived in particular areas that got taken over. The conquerors, explorers, whatever you want to call them, started noticing unusual and unpleasant symptoms. Was this a new contagion? Pretty obvious thought. They'd caught something that they weren't immune to. They didn't see it physically in the native population because the native population was pretty used to it. It was probably one of those diseases that if you're used to it, you get very mild symptoms and you hardly even notice them. Somebody who comes along who doesn't have the immunity gets really severe symptoms. In the past, people used to think that was a different disease, but very often it's the same one. It's just you get a more severe reaction. That's exactly what they had. Very, very severe reaction. Rashes all over. I'll show you some horrific pictures in a minute. Um, really unpleasant <coughs> symptoms. And there was really not very much doubt where they got it from. So, obviously a lot of the people who'd come were going back to Europe. In fact, they took some of the native population with them. But on the whole, they went back. And they took back, probably, probably, the most likely story is they took back this problem, the horrible rashes and other symptoms that we'll talk about in a minute. And they referred to it in Europe when they got back as the great pox. That just means a horrible unknown disease that had really disgusting symptoms and that you probably died of. And believe you me, if they were calling it the great pox in Europe at this time, it must have been bad because there were pretty awful diseases around. Okay, let's see what happened. There is an alternative story, I'll just mention this really quickly, that in fact, this might not have been brought back from the New World. It's possible that this had been hanging around in European populations for a while. What makes us think that? Well, there is some evidence, and this is how history of medicine often gets evidence from archaeology. There was some evidence that changes in ancient bones might have shown that there had been a problem. Lesions in bones. Of course, we only know that now. They didn't know it back then. But there is a possibility now that we can look at the bones that are dug up 
And we know that this great pox, which I'll tell you what it was in a minute, could actually cause lesions in the bones. It possible, it had been around in Europe, but perhaps it had gone into abeyance, the way diseases do. However, diseases um, at that period are diagnosed by topical, on the surface, symptoms. They were horrible. But a lot of diseases had similar symptoms. So rashes, pustules on the skin, this kind of thing confused the issue. Which one was it? Were they all the same? Was this all the same kind of thing? And the reason it mattered was, how was it actually passed on from person to person? Okay, well, let's have a quick look. As this disease, contagion, to give it its word then, took off over Europe, the European continent and the UK, it was referred to by different names. And you can see a bit of xenophobia sitting in here. Um, if you were in Spain, for example, you called it the French disease. If you were in Italy, you called it the Spanish disease. Um, if you were in England, you called it anything but English. It was obviously some horrible foreign disease. Why did people want to wash their hands of it? Because gradually, gradually, it was becoming obvious that the method of transmission of the disease was at the very least very close contact and at the very most probably sexual contact. So anything, of course, that has a sexual element to it in this period, people don't really want to have anything to do with. So the French are saying, well, we're respectable. It couldn't possibly be us. And the Italians are saying, oh, we're just as respectable. Couldn't be us either. So everybody's wanting to blame everybody else. Really, really horrible. You can see this poor woman sitting up in bed here, absolutely covered in pustules. We don't know if this was that disease, but it possibly was. Um, down here, poor bloke who's equally covered in pustules. Um, here's a couple of doctors treating them, remember, holding the urine flask, which, of course, will do no good whatsoever, but still. And somebody looking here, see as if he's putting ointment on the pustules. He's got his little jar here, and he's got his spatula thing. That's what makes us think that picture is probably this disease. You'll find out what it is in a minute. Here are some of the really horrible symptoms. This is a picture from much later, of course. This was from the 19th century of how the rash could take off all over the body, but just not all over the body, as we'll see. Okay, here's where a bit of the detective work starts. This bloke, quite a famous name. You possibly haven't heard of him, but he is quite famous. Um, he was an academic doctor. Girolamo Fracastorio, you can see he had the usual uh, Latin name because he was a, an academic doctor, Fracastorius. You can see his dates there, late 15th to early 16th century. He was a physician, a poet, a philosopher. And he studied this disease in great detail. He, was, uh, he couldn't avoid it. Why? Because he was in Italy and the disease was all over the place. You study something that's a current problem. Exactly what he did, exactly what people do nowadays in medical research. He's interested. But he does something that perhaps most medical researchers wouldn't do these days with it, if they're investigating a disease. He, he investigates it, certainly, but he doesn't just write a learned book, although he does that. His book is called De Morbus Contagiosis, about um, the deathly contagion, is what that means. He does something else, as well as writing his learned academic book. He writes a poem. And the poem has a hero, who's a shepherd. And he gives the name to his hero, the shepherd, Syphilis. Yes, well, he wouldn't do that these days, obviously. But it's him who conjures up this name. Nobody's ever heard of it much, but it's a euphonic, Arcadian, lovely-sounding name. That's why, unfortunately, poor old Syphilis um, has a very, very unfortunate time of it. In the poem, he catches this horrible disease, and Fracastorius doesn't hold back about his symptoms. He go, you wouldn't really want to read it, actually. He goes into it in great detail about the horrible symptoms that poor old syphilis is suffering from. And also, 
makes it completely clear that he considers this to be a sexually transmitted disease, does Fracastorius. On what grounds, you might say, does he consider that? Well, let's have a look. Fracastorius suggests that syphilis, the great pox, call it what you like, is actually caused by something he refers to as imperceptible particles. Ah, that's a bit of an interesting idea. Something that's actually passed on from person to person, probably sexually, or at any rate by very close contact. But you might say, well, that's all very well, but imperceptible means you can't perceive them. You can't see them. So how on earth can he possibly know that? He's a bit like Harvey with the capillaries. He thinks because of his research into this disease, it must be something like this. Although, to be fair, he can't actually prove it. But he thinks there's a pretty good chance this is what it is. Unfortunately, at this period, there's not really a lot that can be suggested for cures, regardless of whether you think it's imperceptible particles or not. A couple of suggestions, and this is why we think that bloke with the paste was probably cure, trying to cure the great pox. Mercury ointment. That's one of the first suggestions. It's quite cheap. You don't need to pay a lot for it, but it's also incredibly nasty. Because, of course, mercury in large doses is a poison. So if you put it on broken skin, it'll go into the bloodstream. Get too much of it, your gums get spongy, your teeth fall out. Um, get really, really too much of it, you die of it. So it's nasty. But it does appear to cure the top... No, cure, but perhaps heal up a little bit, the topical lesions, because that's what people are going on, these topical lesions. After this, for about 300 years, if you visit somebody's house and you go through their bathroom cabinet, say, nobody ever goes through bathroom cabinets, of course, but if you do, and you find mercury ointment, people got very gossipy and said, aha, we know what's the matter with them, don't they? If they have mercury ointment, it must be venereal disease because that's the only reason people have it. So right up to the 19th and early 20th century, mercury ointment was used for venereal disease. Was there anything else? Yes, there was. And here's where we come into the area of pharmaceutical companies for the first time. Gaiac bark. Very expensive but much less unpleasant. It comes from the bark of a South American tree. Um, it's imported into Europe as a kind of... In, in, it's, in, it's in water. It's like a fusion, as it, an infusion. And here in this picture, I don't know if you can see it very clearly, are people actually being treated with gaiac bark. Uh, it looks like a scene of torture, but it's actually not. Um, they heated the gaiac bark in the water, and apparently you put a patient in there. Here's the head of a patient, and here's what he's sink in his little sort of Turkish bath here. And you suffused this patient with the fumes of the gaiac bark. They inhaled it. it. It soothed their skin. It probably did do that. It probably did soothe their skin. And this was seen as being an alternative to the really horrible and dangerous mercury ointment. Gaiac bark wasn't dangerous. Whether it actually did any good, of course, is another thing. But it was extremely expensive. And it also led to the rise of a rather unfortunately named pharmaceutical company called Fuggers, um, who came, and that is the correct spelling, who came from Switzerland and also started Switzerland as being the centre of the pharmaceutical industry. So this family firm got a monopoly on the importation of Gaiac bark. And anyone who could afford it and was unfortunately suffering from these symptoms would buy it and would spend quite a lot of money on it. So we'll see, particularly in next week's lecture, how this leads to pharmaceutical companies making a very large amount of money out of what might be seen as something that's a positive cure. Diet bark wasn't, but it was a step in the direction. Okay, so here's lots and lots of people suffering from this really horrible disease. Here's Fracastorius trying to do something about it. What was his problem? This was the problem. Exactly the same as with Harvey a few weeks ago. He had no microscope. 
He couldn't look down a microscope to see where these imperceptible particles were. This doesn't come until the next century. When we get people, men, who were very like um, Bill Gates, for example, with all his uh, technological companies that he started up. Technological uh, entrepreneurs, they attempt to bring technology into medicine. Where does this come from? Well, it comes from spectacle glasses manufactured. They've been manufactured for quite a while, have spectacles. In the low countries, countries that are now Belgium and Holland, countries like that, that's the area where they make them. And this is where the, ma the magnifying technology comes from. But it's needed to be even better magnification. But good to start with people who know about it. Remember, that was Harvey's capillary problem. As I said, he couldn't see it. So, who's our famous entrepreneur here? Picture of him there. Bloke called Anthony von Leeuwenhoek, very well-known name. The Bill Gates of the 17th century, you might say. Very, very keen on new technology and very keen to get new technology used. No point in inventing it if you don't get it used. It's like now, you're being encouraged to use your phones for just about everything. Well, of course you are, because then people are going to keep buying them, aren't they? Exactly the same with the microscopes. So Van Leeuwenhoek starts with something that looks like this. Believe it or not, that's actually a microscope. A little handheld lens, really. Obviously, over the years, it gets considerably improved. But what did he see with that? Well, actually, as far as we know, quite frankly, not all that much. He reported on stuff that he could see he called what he saw through his microscope in the fluids that he, he got animalcules. Not really sure what that was. It could have been sperm. It could have been blood cells. He could have actually seen some microbes floating in the fluid that he had. But of course, he didn't know. So nobody else really knew either. But nevertheless, despite the fact it wasn't terribly successful, it was the beginning of a new idea. Something invades the body, and if you use the new technology, you can see it. So if you can see it, maybe there's a chance you can actually do something about it. Okay, moving on quickly then. Microscopy really comes to the rescue in the 19th century. Very, very much improved. Microscopes, not very different. Well, your, yours, the ones you use today, are probably a little bit more technically advanced, but not very different from the ones, say, I used at school. They, they didn't change all that much. So much improved in the 19th century. Um, remember last week we talked about Rudolf Virchow in Germany, the bloke who was um, looking at the tissue samples? And he was teaching his university students, because he had a university position, to look microscopically. So from this period, every university student like you who's doing science or medicine has to know how to look down a microscope. And they have to know how to use them. And they have to know how to look microscopically. Strangely enough, the person who's usually associated with this area is actually somebody who doesn't really deserve quite as much fame as he's got. Rudolf Virchow actually deserves a lot more fame, and I'm quite sure Far fewer of you will have heard of him than have heard of Louis Pasteur. Just about everyone's heard of Louis Pasteur. <laughs> Nevertheless, he was influential, just not maybe as influential as, as he might like to have thought. You can see his dates here. These were in the mid-19th century. And there is a picture of Pasteur. Pasteur was what we would call these days a control freak. He controlled his publicity. And he nearly always had his picture painted or later on had a photograph taken of him on his own, staring meaningfully at a test tube or something like that. In other words, the genius at work. Actually, he had a large team around him um, to whom he gave work to do. Obviously, it's what you do in science. But he very rarely showed them. He's a bit of a megalomaniac, quite frankly. But he did make the word biology famous. Nobody used the word biology before the 19th century. It had, had no meaning. Chemistry, yes. Pasteur was actually a chemist originally. 
But he saw, as we'll see in a minute, that his work didn't actually involve chemical reactions in the body, as he thought. It actually involved biological reactions. Hence the word biology, a neologism for the 19th century. Nobody would heard it before. So what did he do? Why is he so famous? Well, he's famous because he was a self-publicist, obviously, but he did, he did some good work. He actually started out, as I said, as a chemist. He, and he was an industrial chemist. He did work for the French wine industry. As you're probably familiar with, French wine industry still today is a huge industry. Um, they were very worried, were the French wine industry, about their wine going off. Better transport by now, you can export it. But nobody wants bottles of wine exported that have gone off. How can you stop the wine going off? So they ask Pasteur, as a chemist, to have a look at this. And he does some experiments. You're possibly familiar with these. Just about every science class gets told about them, so I won't go into it in great detail. He sets up an experiment with what are referred to as the swan net flasks. In other words, the flasks that the air can't get into to see whether the fluid in there goes off. And his conclusion is it doesn't. There's no fermentation, as the wine would do, or putrefaction, as solids would do, like meat. Doesn't go off if the air is excluded. Is the air the cause? Nah, says Pasteur, it can't be the air. We'd all be dead, obviously. It must be something in the air. Back to Fracastorius's imperceptible particles. In fact, by this time, they're becoming referred to as germs. Germs floating in the air. But not exactly, don't be fooled, not that you're likely to read much written in the 19th century, I understand that. But if you did and you read about germs, they don't quite mean what we mean. You've got to be careful with that. What they actually meant in the 19th century was a germ as a kind of seed of disease. That if it went into your body, it would kind of grow a disease. So as you can see, not quite what we would understand by germs. Nevertheless, a new idea. So, very quickly then, this notion of disease specificity, specific <laughs> disease caused by a specific entity and consisting of specific symptoms. That, must just, that just means look out for microbes in French. <coughs> There's a really evil looking microbe. Uh, the microbe enters the body according to this theory and creates a state of the body manifested by specific internal and external symptoms. Not quite as specific, actually, we know these days, as they used to think. You can get very confused with symptoms. But nevertheless, for the sake of argument for a minute, this is what this particular theory says. And it's confirmed, this disease that you now have, by bedside and post-mortem anatomy. Remember that? They weren't just going to be, later on, looking for lesions they were going to be looking for what was the cause of that lesion. So rather than saying, oh, there's an interesting lesion on the, um, in the bowels, I um, wonder how that happened, to say, well, it's possibly happening by the invasion of a microbe into the body and causing a physiological reaction. So instead of just having the physical, physiological reaction, you've got the work of microbes as well. So now we've gone from physiological explanations of disease to bacteriological ones. Of course, we know you can still have physiological ones with diabetes or something like that. But this is adding on, not instead of necessarily, but adding on a new layer of possibilities for causes of disease. Um, one, just to give you an example, in case you think you wonder what I'm talking about here. Um, a problem, a health problem, referred to in the past as typhoid, which of course we still have today. Typhoid was originally an adjective. In other words, a typhoid state of the body, where you, had, you were vomited, you, you, ha you had a temperature, um, you probably died of it, unfortunately, and you also had lesions in the body. Typhoid is now a specific disease, and that's how we refer to it these days. You're suffering from typhoid. Typhoid. 
not you're in a typhoid state. So this is how it works. Okay, moving on. <coughs> Quickly then. Um, initially, not much in the way of implications for physical physicians, for physical medicine. Why? Because you might know a microbe enters the body, but what can you do about it? Quite frankly, at this stage, not a lot. It does have implications initially for surgery. Poor old John Hunter would probably wish he could have been alive to, um, in this period because there was actually something you could do in surgery. Initially, surgery turns out to be a problem. Here's one, this picture here is one of the first photographs, actually it's a daguerreotype, taken in the 1840s, actually a photograph, taken in the 1840s at Massachusetts General Hospital. Of course it was posed later, obviously, because you had to stay very still for a very long time. So it wasn't actually in the middle of an operation. They came in and they posed later on. Um, but it's, the op it's an operation, an internal operation. You can see the man's rather touching, he kept his socks on. And here's some interested surgeons peering at what's happening. Um, so the patient's knocked out. Oh, amazing, amazing. What does this mean? It means you can do more slower operations on infected wounds. And far more patients are coming from cities, industrial cities now by the 19th century, possibly what these blokes are doing here. And please notice none of them have changed their clothes. There's no face masks, there's no white robes. It's just an, it's just an old room in the hospital that they're doing it in. So you can imagine the danger of infection here is massive. And if you do a really quick operation, probably not so much, but a slow one, mm -hmm. very unfortunate. They're doing the extension of Hunter's physiological surgery, trying to cure. Ironically, they're doing exactly the opposite. They're actually creating more complications. They're creating horrible surgical infections. So the 19th century, they claim that there's a pandemic of surgical infection. Ah, here's where the notion of germs entering the body can help. How's that? Well, with the work of Joseph Lister, who was a, a surgeon in, in the UK in the 1860s, he gets the idea that with his surgery, which was done in a industrial city, Glasgow, he can actually keep the microbes out. How does he do that? He does it by using carbolic acid. And he does it in a rather strange way. Here's one of his operations. As you can see, still nobody's changed their clothes. It's all pretty dirty. But, but, he has the carbolic spray that sprays the room with carbolic acid. And the idea is you're killing all the microbes in the air. He also later on makes his surgeons wash up their hands in carbolic, and later on he dips his instruments in carbolic. Actually, unbelievably, it does make a difference. His rates for surgical operations, deaths, are very low. I think they didn't die of carbolic acid, you might think, but no. Referred to as antiseptic surgery. And it's a forerunner to aseptic surgery, which is what we have today. Great idea. You can do something in surgery. Later on, of course, they used heat and things like that to, and proper operating theatres to keep the microbes out. So there is something you can do. Yet again, surgery leads the way. There's something you can do there. But, finishing off quickly, there's still nothing you can do in internal medicine. And here's our final person for today, Robert Koch, his name you might well know. He was the one who did the microbe hunting. He was a general practitioner in Germany. You can see his dates there. And he's the one, you certainly should know him, because he set up what you might call the laboratory method for the 19th century. Staining, find the bug, stain it, put it on a Petri dish. You can see them all here. And then you examine them under the microscope. And he says, once we've caught these things and put, stained them with the new German dyes, which are being manufactured at that period, look at them through your new improved microscope and try and work out what particular disease they cause. 
This led to a massive amount of microbe hunting in Europe and in colonial areas in this period. So not only looking for local microbes, but also looking for ones um, which are tropical, which come from other kinds of areas. It must be true, says Koch. And he sets up what's called Koch's postulates, which if you're interested, you can look up, that says one microbe equals one disease. You have to retrieve it from a person or an animal who's suffering from that disease. You then should be able to inoculate it back into somebody who will then suffer from an animal. Of course, you're doing this with mainly. Who will then suffer from the same disease. And that proves that it's not just random microbes that cause random problems. So this microbe hunting in Europe becomes a huge medical project. And just imagine you're a young, enthusiastic, very, very ambitious medical student or young doctor in this period. What you want to do, once you've left university, is get into the microbe hunting. Take yourself off to some part of the world where, with any luck, nobody else has been. Set up your little lab, like Koch has done here. Hunt for the microbes. As try to associate them with a particular disease. And if you're very, very, very lucky, they'll actually call the microbe after you. So if you look at the name of some microbes, even nowadays, you can see they've actually got people's names attached. It might seem like a strange sort of posterity, but still. People thought this was a great thing to do. And in fact, that's what led to the rise of tropical medicine because people had to go further and further away to try and find more and more microbes. So, to finish on a slightly unpositive note, at the same time as Koch was doing all this, back to syphilis. By this time, it had become an epidemic in many of the 19th century cities. Referred to, it wasn't just syphilis, of course, gonorrhea, various other kinds of venereal disease. People coming together who'd never been together before in really, really unfortunate circumstances caused this horrible epidemic of syphilis. Not helped, of course, not very long after that, by World War I. Huge numbers of armies going all over the place. Again, syphilis and venereal disease in general becomes a huge problem. But for all their work that had been started off by syphilis and continued through the centuries, there was certainly diagnosis. They were excellent on the diagnosis. But still, and we're at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century here, still no cure. So, second part of this lecture will be next week. And what we'll look for is the hunt for the magic bullet. This rather strange-looking person here, who's called Caspar the Hunter, will explain what he's got to do with it and his gun with the bullets in it, and how the microbes finally got vanquished, although, as it turns out, not quite. Okay, all right, we'll see you all next week.